Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. We welcome members of the STEM learning ecosystem community of practice and our colleagues from education networks throughout the country. I'm Mark Cisliano, a partner at TIES, and excited to share Community as the Campus, a collaborative approach to education redesign. Uh, it goes without saying that this is an uncertain, unprecedented time. The inequity in our education, healthcare, and social systems have been exposed for the world to see. It's real, um, it's heavy, and, and it's hard. Yet through all of this, we know that in a few weeks, schools will reopen. All 50 states recently submitted applications for competitive funding from uh, CARES Act relief funds targeting redesign with remote learning in mind. 14 of those states will receive funding and will issue RFPs to K-12 districts in their states. Additionally, our corporate and private philanthropy partners are offering resources and support as they can. And districts are even repurposing internal funds for redesign at this moment. And while all of our education leaders have been thinking through scenarios, planning for reopening for months, we know that this moment is bigger than just the education sector. We have a once in a lifetime opportunity to reimagine and rethink an education system that works for all students, all families and educators to transform our democracy. So what do we do with this moment? There's a children's book titled, What Do You Do With The Problem? Uh, and as the story goes, you get brave, you take risks, you say yes to new experiences. And so this is a call to action. STEM learning ecosystems or the concept of an ecosystem with learning as the focus, supported by partnerships all around it, wherever learning takes place, is the ideal model to apply and leverage as we think about redesigning our education systems. Teaching and learning will happen in person and in remote settings. And it could continue business as usual, isolated, fragmented, and inequitable for so many learners. Or if we take the design seriously and we focus on our cross partner collaboration, learning could be more meaningful. It could be transformative. At its core, learning must be redesigned with a focus on equity, social emotional well-being, deeper learning, and health and safety for all involved. So let's design this together. I'd like to introduce my colleague, Veronica Gonzalez, the STEM Learning Ecosystems Community of Practice Director, who will moderate our panel of thought leaders from across the country as we raise the questions, frame the big ideas to take action and rethink education with a community as the campus approach. Veronica. Thanks, Mark. Um, hello, everyone. Again, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. Um, as Mark mentioned, my name is Veronica Gonzalez, and I am the director of the STEM Learning Ecosystem Community of Practice. Um, I am excited because through so many years together, we as STEM ecosystems have worked to cultivate new systems of learning and set a vision to, for what that looks like for our community. Um, we've all celebrated together when STEM ecosystems became our nation's number one priority in the National STEM Strategy Plan. Uh, we've come together countless times as a community of practice, both in person and virtually, to tackle challenges and learn from one another. We are in a very unique moment right now, as Mark mentioned. Um, challenging moment, but uh, also a once in a lifetime opportunity for us to really think through the way that we want to redesign these systems, um, drive true and meaningful and lasting change for learners and families in our community. Uh, all of you on this call as ecosystem leaders know this better than anybody else. You have already been doing this work in your communities and oftentimes leading the charge, sometimes as the only voice in the room about creating these types of partnerships and thinking about things like equity and social emotional learning um, as part of that process. Uh, and so now we truly feel like it's our time as ecosystems and the STEM learning ecosystem community of practice. 
Uh, as Mark mentioned, the school year is approaching and we still don't have answers about what's going to happen um, as we think about the way of going back to school, remote learning, et cetera. Um, and so I think this series or this conversation is going to be the starting point for us to think through the vision and the tactics, strategies, um, and partnerships that are really going to be necessary for us to think through in the coming school year. Um, Mark mentioned the CARES Act, so the funding streams will be a part of that. Uh, thinking about having a pulse on the states and federal governments. Um, I, someone mentioned Della, who's our policy person, who is unfortunately not able to be with us today, but we have spoken with her about quite a few things. Um, and so keeping a pulse on all of these things together so that we can really do what's best for our families um, and our learners at our, at, in our communities. Um, so I want you to keep that in mind as this hour passes for us together. Uh, we will be following up with today's webinar to speak to each of you uh, about what your needs are, what you're thinking about, what conversations are happening on the ground to ensure that this is just not a one-time deal, um, but that these conversations continue to happen as a community of practice for us to design this together and to learn from one another. Um, so before we get started, quick housekeeping, because you have to do that on these calls. Um, you are all in listen-only mode now. We would love to unmute you as we get further in the conversation for a question and answer. So uh, as you are here and questions come up, we encourage you to type those in the Q&A box. Um, you are able to vote those questions up or down so that it will help us prioritize what we get to first. Um, we are recording today's webinar, so if you or colleagues that you know would like to listen back to this, we'll make it available to you via email and on our website. We will also be following up with you with a survey to make sure that we are listening and really determining the next best steps for this conversation to continue to unfold over a period of time. Um, and I think that might be my, I went out of order on my housekeeping, but I think that that might be it. Uh, so it's now my pleasure to introduce our panelists who you see on the screen with us here, um, including uh, Hugh Vasquez, who is a senior associate at the National Equity Project. Um, he is, he and his team have coined this phrase rebel leaders and we feel like we have really assembled a, a a team of rebel leaders today to, to start this conversation. Um, it's such an appropriate term for Hugh, who has worked since 2010 with schools and nonprofits to create environments where youth and adults from all cultures are honored, valued, and respected. This term also fits Eric Gordon, who has transformed one of the country's poorest performing school districts into one that is functioning well, where students are graduating and where attendance is way up and there is tons of hope. Uh, Gordon and his team have collaborated with the city's mayor, businesses, and community-based organizations to unite the people of Cleveland around a collective mission that's transformed their school system. The term rebel leader also fits our friend and colleague, Dr. Calvin Mackey, who with a team of committed and passionate creative leaders are working parish by parish in New Orleans to bring STEM and hope to students in the area. He quite literally lives and breathes STEM and embeds social justice in every single thing that he does. Uh, and finally, this term definitely works also for our colleague and friend, Kristen Lewis Warner, uh, our partner at the Pear Institute, um, who's supporting their groundbreaking work around the role of social emotional needs and learning and embedding that in everything that's done. She's not afraid to ask questions and to push for what we fundamentally need as humans to learn and thrive and really work from the heart. Um, so we'll make sure that all of the bios for our panelists and our rebel leaders are there and available for you. Uh, but for now, let's start the discussion. So um, Mr. Eric Gordon, I'm gonna open up the floor to you and would love to invite you to speak about STEM, equity, and the unique moment in time that we find ourselves in now. Thank you. Good morning and good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm actually going to start with a quote from one of my favorite writers and activists, Audre Lorde. Audre Lorde was a self-described black lesbian mother warrior poet who dedicated her life and talent to confronting injustices of racism, sexism, classism, heterosexism, and homophobia. And I think it's particularly powerful right now in the COVID moment. Her quote is, 
for the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. They may allow us temporarily to beat him at his own game, but they'll never enable us to bring about genuine change. And I lift that to start because COVID-19 has created a once in a lifetime opportunity in that the master's house has been obliterated. We can't go back to school as normal, even if we wanted to. Uh, Hugh Vasquez, who's on with us today, wrote a really powerful piece about what if we didn't return, return to school as normal. This is our opportunity to create new tools and to abandon the tools that have kept us trapped in an equitable and unjust system for so long. My team and I in Cleveland have really challenged ourselves to take everything we've already done and really create a full mastery-based learning system where we want our learners to be engaged in productive struggle with an appropriately complex group-worthy task from which they can demonstrate their learning in authentic ways. One of the dichotomies that COVID-19 that's created that I wanna pierce and challenge is this notion that learning happens at school and then secondarily, if it can't happen at school, it happens remotely. And somehow there's no other place where learning occurs. And what I hope that you'll walk away with our dialogue today is this notion of community as campus, not just by word, but truly as your community is a learning ecosystem. And so I want you to think about all of the places and ways in a community that kids can learn. It could be place-based learning, like museums or art galleries or music venues or science centers or parks. It could be workplace learning opportunities like job shadows, internships, apprenticeships, learn and earn. It's relationship-based learning opportunities, student organized learning events, mentoring relationships, coaching and support, counseling. And counseling is a verb, not a noun, a person who does something, but actual work that we do. It is through those authentic demonstrations of learning to community members, presenting to authentic audiences, holding juried exhibits, production of artifacts and awarding of credentials. It's research and inquiry opportunities in partnership with libraries and um, you know, community colleges and universities. It's public-private partnerships uh, with you know, other uh, community-based organizations and nonprofits in the community. It's service opportunities inside of your community uh, that exist. It's individualized learning opportunities, tools that students can use to learn on their own. And that comes with a lot of opportunity also to re-engage in a policy context at our local level, how we design our system, uh, what our systems are designed to do, what they permit and promote, and what they prohibit, but also how we leverage that to reorient our state and our federal uh, policies as well. And then when you have that entire learning ecosystem where kids can use the entire community to inform authentic, complex tasks, and again, group worthy so that it's socialized, so that the kids are working together as learners, using their social and emotional skills in the presence of content. Um, that it's then, then that we can leverage the kind of more traditional teaching by using smaller seminars, small group tutorials, tutoring and micro lessons to fill in the academic content that students need in order to be able to wrestle uh, with those tasks. And then the last thing I would say with my introductory remarks is to consider also the integrated health and basic needs that are available in our community that can again be embedded into a full learning experience so that our kids will get the emotional supports that they're going to need to uh, recover and rebound and thrive coming out of this. Um, we can either choose to decide that we've had a lost generation or a renaissance and I think this opportunity to use community as campus could be a renaissance for all kids, kids in Cleveland and across the country. So welcome, really look, looking forward to discussing with the other panelists. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eric. And so much of what you said is just fundamental to what we believe as, as ecosystems, that learning happens everywhere and that we really need to think about the whole human and the whole community in the way that we approach things. It's not a siloed approach to learning happens here and health happens over here. It's all interconnected. Um, and so we appreciate the work that you're doing in, in Cleveland and the Neostem um, ecosystem region. Um, we are going to pass from there um, to our good friend, Dr. Mackey, to, to hear from him a little bit more about um, STEM and equity and the, the community engagement piece um, as part of introductory remarks. So um, thank you again, uh, Eric Gordon, and, and we pass it on to you, Dr. Mackey. 
thank you, Veronica, and thank you, STEM Ecosystems, for having me and all that you do. And Eric, thank you for your compliments because they lead right into what I want to talk about. You made mention of a, of a lost generation, and I'm sorry, STEM is happening outside my building. They're actually destroying another building. So if you all hear something, that's just my, my hype music. Uh, <laughs> Eric talked about a lost generation. I'll never forget I was having a conversation with one of my elders, and he said, Mac, if you, if you take my son to the mall, and you come back from the mall and talk about you lost my son, I would say, no, you didn't. You left my son. And I need you to go back and get my son. So we're not talking about a lost generation. We're talking about a generation that's been left. And we have to, what has happened is that we got so engrossed in education and so engrossed into the, to the buildings and to the, the policy of education, we left the community behind. And I think what COVID has done is that it's opened up the, the kabuno so we can see all of the pieces that's been detached. And like Eric said, we have to work together to bring back uh, education in a holistic sense such that education can take place anywhere the kid, the, the kid may be. So for STEM NOLA, what we've done is that we've created a community-centered ecosystem where we're building an ecosystem from the community and out to all of these assets that always existed. We've spent too much time and too much energy making sure the assets exist and never got back down to the community. So we believe that a high functioning community is child-centered, adult-governed, elder rule. No matter whether you go in history and you look at a well-structured community, all the decisions that are made are made through the lenses of what's best for the children. So what we've done is that we've gone to the community and asked the community. When communication fails, abnormality sits in. A lot of times we talk to each other but we don't talk to the community because we believe we know what's best for the community. We've had, we have the training, we have the skills, but sometimes when you ask the community, they will point you directly to where you need to be to deliver for them. And when you know where they are, you can meet them where they are. So we deal with all of the kids in the community. We believe that STEM have to be as ubiquitous as sports. It's amazing that all of our kids can go to school, play sports, and when they leave school, no matter where they go, whether it's they're standing on the street corner, in their backyard, in a recreation facility, they have access to the same sports. So we have to make STEM as ubiquitous as sports, such that when a kid get engaged and exposed in a library and school, when they come home to the community, that STEM is there too. So uh, the community got to be well structured, and your STEM ecosystem must have a commit must have a component that drives down to the community and seek feedback from the community. And when I say the community, I'm talking about everybody. I'm not talking about a middle class lens. I'm talking about the least of these. Go and talk to the people who otherwise don't have access to the things that my two privileged kids have. We created STEM NOLA because my two sons, with a father who has a PhD in engineering, was getting this amazing training. And my son challenged me one day to give it to his friends. And he, believed, he knew that he was exposed to somebody and things that his friends had not been exposed and he believed in his heart of hearts if his friends were exposed to the people and the things, they'll be just as bright as him. And I believe that all of us have that capacity to take what we're doing, take it out of the schoolhouse, and bring it into the community and engage the people where they are, whether it's online or offline, but we must meet the people where they are. And I have a, you know, just in closing, you know, I've always been told that if, you, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. COVID has shown us the people who are not at the table. And now it's our responsibility to help them set a table for themselves so that they'll never be without again. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Dr. Mackey. Um, you really brought equity to the to the streets, for lack of a better term, as, as Dave Chappelle would say. But it's real, right? Like how we we have conversations about things like equity, and we so often miss the mark, um, and that this is. We knew inequities existed across racial lines, across socioeconomic lines, um, across connectivity, right? We're, but COVID just showed everybody what that looked like. Um, and so I think this is really an opportunity for us to peel back that layer and, and get our hands dirty and get into the community and do that. So we really appreciate you um, 
taking the time to, to talk us through what you're doing in New Orleans and thinking about equity from that very community embedded lens uh, and STEM as a, a great equalizer um, within that community work. Um, speaking of equity, I think uh, now is an appropriate time to introduce uh, Hugh Vasquez of the National Equity Project for him to uh, walk us through a few pieces as well that they are thinking about and want us to consider um, as we are redesigning our communities as campuses. So, you. Let me see. Um, Hugh, I think you're muted yep. right now. Oh, now. There we go, perfect, okay, okay. great. I'll repeat. Thank you, Veronica, for all this. And I'm going to uh, use a few slides to look at some pieces of equity. The focus that I'm bringing today kind of builds on what Dr. Mackey and uh, what Eric said earlier, um, that COVID has shown us something, but it's shown us something that has been true forever. And uh, yet it's, it's now highlighted in a way that hasn't been before. So we're taking the opportunity to see the system that has been designed, the system that has been designed to produce what it produces. So I wanna begin uh, in some very quick comments with this Thomas Jefferson piece that, that shows that what he said was that they were gonna, he was a father of education and public education and that the, the system that he wanted to produce was one where there were two different tracks one for the laboring and one for the learned. And scholarship would allow a very few of the laboring class to advance by raking a few geniuses from the rubbish. So we know that our system was designed to produce inequities. It was designed for haves and have nots, for some to make it and some to not make it from the very beginning. Let's go to the next slide. Um, this is just a, a placeholder image of here's what some classroom, the classrooms look like in the 1900s, a picture of that. Look at, look at this and look at the next slide. The class of the 1900s and the current classroom. This is to make the point that the structure that was begun from Thomas Jefferson and has led all the way to what we are seeing today um, has been a structure designed to do schooling in a very particular way. And it is not the way that most kids live, uh, learn, let alone um, children of color or children from poverty. Um, it just isn't the way that we're learning. Let's go to the next slide. So this is a core belief that, is, that our equity work is based on, the belief that our public education system was not created to give everyone equal opportunity. The structures, um, past and present, are maintaining inequity by design. So if we are going to shift what we are seeing in education, we have to see the system that was built and the system that we inherited. And we have to see that the system was designed to produce what it's producing. And that is going to lead us to the question of if it was designed this way for inequities, how then do we design it for equity to be a result instead? So let's go to the next one. So here's one image to a metaphor to keep in, 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 in mind when you think about uh, the difference between equality and equity. Um, so here's what we're after, right? What some say we're after in education, that we're trying to get to a diploma and we're all climbing ladders in order to get there. But the reality is the next slide. So here's what we really have. We have a system that is biased and that is systemic in what it's producing. So you see that some are advantaged, not because they earned that advantage, but because they're placed on blocks that get them closer to the diploma. Uh, and then it goes all the way over to broken ladders where you're starting out in the hole. So this is an image of inequity in our system. And it shows that if we are trying to help every student and every child actually get to an outcome like a diploma, then we have to look at how the system was designed to help us get there and how the system was designed to keep some of us from getting there. Next slide, please. So this is a, a belief that we have about what, what it takes from us as, as leaders. And we, we encourage everybody to see themselves as a leader, that the role of leaders is to make inequities visible, that's seeing the system, disrupt policies and practices that perpetuate inequities, and then design new ways of building communities and educating our young people. 
so that everybody belongs and everybody thrives. That's essentially what our work is about when we talk about equity work. It's about disrupting and building. Next slide. Just a couple more thoughts. We are after this notion of what we're calling rebel leadership and appreciate uh, Veronica that you kind of opened at least what I saw with that. And let's go to the next slide because this is one definition of what we mean. If we see ourselves as rebel leaders, it means we're doing this. Rebels are people who break rules that should be broken. They break rules that hold them and others back and their way of rule breaking is constructive rather than destructive. It creates positive change Rebel leadership involves positive deviance. So in a nutshell, what we are after when it comes to the equity work that we promote throughout systems that we work with is that we create rebel leaders who see a need for the change, who see the system and who take action that begins to redesign the system that we're sitting in so that we can produce a, a, a system that is based on equity where all belong and all thrive. So let me leave it there. And thank you for the opportunity. I do apologize that I left one meeting to come into this one. And in a few minutes, I'm going to have to transition back to my other meeting. No, and don't apologize. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you being here um, and taking the time to talk us through, you know, the history of where the school system came from and the inequities that were embedded, embedded into the design. Um, and so now this is really exciting for us to think about this as, as ecosystems, how do we want to change that design so that we have a more equitable system for all of our, all of our learners, all of our families, all of our communities um, together really should be something that we're thinking about and embedding in everything that we do. So Hugh, thank you for taking the time, especially leaving a meeting uh, to come with us. We'll keep you in the loop. And, and for all of you who have joined us, um, Hugh's sort of uh, part of this team that, that, of thought leaders that we're thinking through and, and, and rebel leaders um, as we think through what this, what this work looks like in all of our communities. So thank you again. Um, I think in, in and in, um, in thinking about equity being embedded in everything that we do, um, there's another space as well uh, around social emotional health and, and needs there that also needs to be something as um, communities that we're truly thinking about, especially after uh, such a traumatic thing that we've all experienced in the pandemic, some more than others. Uh, and so with that, uh, I'd really like to pass the mic over to our friend, Kristen Lewis Warner um, from PEAR to talk us through a little bit about what they're working on in that space of uh, social emotional learning and, and needs for, for both the students and families and, and teachers, right, for all of us, and how we can embed that in this, in this redesign as well. Thank you so much, Veronica. I'm thrilled that uh, Kelvin and Hugh and Eric were able to address the kind of how COVID brought out the inequities. And that is work we're doing at PAIR as well. But um, my lens today will really be focusing in on the social emotional development part um, that COVID has really brought to the forefront. Um, at PAIR, we're, we are located at McLean Hospital and Harvard Medical School. And our work is really anchored in kind of a deep understanding of mental health and well being. And as Mark highlighted before, the real need to really bring in social emotional development and well being for students and educators right now is is huge. Uh, we really recognize the importance of promoting kind of mental health and social emotional well-being in all academic components of students and really look at the landscape as we're leading into the fall. It's so uncertain. Students are bringing in so many challenges. Educators are bringing them in as well, um, as well as the whole system. Um, as ecosystems, you're all going to be addressing this, um, but we really want to recognize the challenges educators really addressing kind of as the fall comes, how they can support students. They're not only going to be supporting their physical and safety well-beings, they're going to really be needing to look at the learning and academic well-beings of students and first and foremost, the mental health well-being. So students really are going to be coming to the table with months of kind of being hankered in place at home with families and those psychological needs are coming to the forefront. With that, we're also going to be having teachers and educators coming to the table with their own challenges and experiences that they've had. We really want to lift up the need and how imperative and paramount kind of addressing the academic 
needs as well as the social emotional development needs of students are right now. Um, at PAIR, we're really looking at kind of three key areas for our students, kind of having that school climate supported for students, really having the environment fostering um, that inclusive environment for students, academic people, all of them coming together, um, making sure all those needs are addressed. We're also looking at the academic needs of students. They're coming to the table with um, months of disrupted learning, um, not having their regular routine, not having out of school time programming happening, not coming to your ecosystem programs to be able to connect with all of you and how we can best support that. And, and also, as I highlighted before, the mental health well-being we don't know what students are going to be bringing to the table. Each will have unique experiences uh, where they're, they're going to be having possible depression, possible anxiety, loss within families, um, possible traumas that have happened. And we need to be at the forefront of addressing those components. Um, for PAIR, with the work we're doing right now, it really is coming at it using our Clover model, which is kind of this whole kind of framework model that we're using to look at the whole student as well as, as the adults as we're looking forward and how to best meet their needs as learners and as people um, thriving, hopefully, and kind of working with this new normal. Um, our Clover model really looks at four different leaves. We look at ac excuse me, active engagement. That's really looking at having classrooms and having environments where students are able to move and be active. We've had months of being kind of locked in and not moving. So we need those students to be able to kind of move and be physical. We need students to come to the table with the next leaf of assertiveness, really being able to have voice and choice. They've been disconnected from their educators and their school environments for so long. We really want them to come in and feel like they're part of that environment and contributing and kind of having a reconnection to their, to their educators and their whole school system. We also really want them to be belonging. This is key for all students and teachers. That belonging leaf that we have in our Clover model is really about friendship and empathy and support in recognizing emotional needs um, and kind of that belonging of educator to educator connecting together, student to student connecting, and especially educator to student in really supporting all the needs for these young these young learners as they're coming. And then lastly, that reflection leaf, really having them come and reflect on their experiences, reflect on their emotions of what's happened to them, and kind of in this environment of not knowing what they're bringing to the table, being able to have them share out with us um, and have them be able to be supported in all ways. So for us, we really kind of see those lenses being able um, through the leaves to support them through the mental health needs, the school climate need and the academic needs. Uh, at PAIR, we're gonna be doing lots of return to school opportunities through trainings um, and webinars as well. We hope you can kind of come to our website and check those out and I know Veronica has shared that we're going to be able to kind of come and do a deeper dive, um, but come come check out what we can do for, you know, supporting and what we can do for you guys as ecosystems through the ties work to, to support the social emotional development needs and also obviously the, the inequities in that social justice lens as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, we really appreciate that. And I think just I live in New York City, um, and so if you don't know, people live in shoeboxes here at times, um, and so that has been weighing very heavily on my mind of when you have multiple family members in a very, very small comfort spine space under stressful circumstances, people may be losing their jobs, um, the siren situation and fireworks now in the city is just, it's a lot, um, and so I think really being mindful about traumas that people are carrying, even in just a very short period of time and what that does to us. Um, how as a community, we really can uh, lift both young people and adults up in those spaces um, and really leverage this redesign and, and thinking about how we rebuild together to work for everybody um, in, a, in, a, in a society that we wanna live in, right? Where we are um, supporting one another through traumatic times instead of sort of pointing their fingers and thinking about you know, pulling ourselves up by whatever bootstraps we're supposed to have. So, um, you know, I, I appreciate the comments uh, from all of the panelists. Uh, we appreciate, again, the time there. We are going to jump into the question and answer period.
and if that's okay with everybody. Um, and we're gonna start out not very easily, uh, so, so sorry, but we have a really great question uh, from Sarah Rowley in the chat box, and I'm gonna kind of combine that with some things that I've been hearing also on the side. Um, you know, all of these things that each and every one of you presented, especially the theories, all sound really great, right? When we're sitting here on Zoom, very comfortably talking about it. Um, but it's hard, and, and our ecosystem leaders know this as they're in their spaces, and sometimes they're the only voice talking about collaboration. Um, what is the goal? How do we integrate things like equity, um, social emotional learning into, and, and these partnerships how does this translate into something that we actually want our young people to know um, and to achieve and to master as they enter adulthood? Um, you know, can we effectively reimagine our system without reimagining how we define what these desired outcomes are? Um, and so I guess that was a very convoluted question and asking all of you, what are the desired outcomes and how do we start to uh, look at the system to get towards those desired outcomes? Um, so I don't know if I should be mean and start picking on folks or if anybody wants to jump in, I'm not seeing anybody like dying to jump in, but um, perhaps I start with you, Eric, just because you responded to Sarah in the chat uh, and you're there as our superintendent and our district leader there. So um, love to, to toss to you first, if that's okay. And then others feel free to jump in. Sure, so, um, you know, again, our approach is a mastery-based learning, and the goal is that we create learners, that it's not that we have the specifically defined curriculum that every child must learn, but that we create learners where they can transfer the skills that we've taught them and, and use them for other learning opportunities. And I'll give a couple of examples of how that can play out. When we opened our STEM high school, which we did as part of the Northeast Ohio STEM Network, it was completely mastery-based learning. Um, the kids didn't take regular classes, they didn't earn Carnegie units, they didn't have seat time, all of these old constructs. Um, but when they graduated, they, we were able to put new tasks in front of them and the students knew how to apply them. But it requires systems change because when those students graduated and we tried to get them into college, they didn't have a transcript that matched what colleges were expecting. And we actually had to reverse engineer uh, transcripts in order to say, well, here's how we showed you completed Algebra 1, or here's how we showed you completed English 3. But if we actually redesign the system, and I pointed out to Sarah about mastery.org, which is the Master Transcript Consortium, we can actually create ways for students to demonstrate their learning through a portfolio of uh, juried exhibits that say, I am a learner, and here's how I move work forward. The other example I would use from an equity lens is when we think about students with disabilities and the frankly really poor job we do in serving these children. Um, and particularly when we write these very discrete goals in reading and math, as opposed to helping the students think about what are the compensatory skills they need in order to tackle reading and math as part of their lived experience in school and beyond school, just like the rest of us. And so if we really shift to building skill sets for students to be able to wrestle with complex content, that's really the goal. And then we design our systems to enable that goal. Um, think about what Hugh Vasco said about how the systems are designed to create inequities. If we actually design systems to personalize and move learners toward a common goal of being able to take learning and use it forward, that's gonna create inequity, that's gonna create equities and close gaps even for our most fragile children. Thank you, Eric. Um, Dr. Mackey, do you have thoughts on this? Like, how are we embedding this type of learning? What is the desired outcome if, if you're thinking about the community, you're thinking about equitable lens? Um, what does that, that outcome look like for you? And, ha and how do we start to move towards that? Uh, again, I mean, Eric pretty much says it all, but I'd like to quote one of my buddies, uh, Eric, uh, Eddie Glowen from Princeton. He's talking about how America has an assault on our imagination. And what he means is that every day we think what is, is. We, we can't reimagine what is. And this is supposed to be the greatest country in the world where we can get up every day and create a better tomorrow for ourselves, but we keep running back to what was when we got, when we got to create something new to get that which we know we need. So the, the, the challenge for all of us is how do we suspend what we know? Alvin Toffler said the illiterate of the 21st century would be he or she who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. It is 
it is, it's, it's, uh, you know, right now we have to unlearn the stuff that we knew to create a new system to get the same results. We, we're not saying, we're not trying to change standards. We're not trying to change what kids need to know, but we have to put in place new pathways for them to get there. And those pathways doesn't necessarily, don't necessarily look like uh, what we had pre, pre-COVID. And, and we know this, we know that there are five different learning styles. Kids learn differently. And we have to create a situation where they can use their greater gift to add collaboratively to other kids to realize that they, that they learned something. So for us in the community, we've suspended all of that. As a matter of fact, one of our theories, Eric, is that we're not school 2.0. So when the educators come, they're like, well, what, where is this? Where is that? And we're like, we're not school 2.0. On a Saturday, if a kid shows up to do STEM and anything reminds him or her of school, everything is lost. So we have to you know, uh, engage our imagination to come up with new methodology such that the kids can learn what it is that they need to learn. And that's what, what Eric and his team uh, have done uh, uh, tremendously. Great, thank you. Um, you know, and, and this feels maybe out of left field, but it absolutely should be embedded in everything. Kristen, what does that look like? What is the desired outcome uh, for learning achievements when you have social emotional learning also at the heart and embedded in everything that we're doing? If we redesign the system that way, what does that look like? Yeah, I mean, I first and foremost, I just thinking about just COVID happening as well as all the social injustices that have happened in this time of being home. It is just staggering to think about what families are absorbing, what students are having to absorb. Um, and I think for the social emotional development lens, it really is about meeting students where they are. And the only way that students are going to thrive and learn is if they are mentally in a well-balanced place as well as supported. And so thinking about where the kids are coming back to school, we need to be able to recognize the academic needs of them, recognize the social justice lens that needs to be promoted. And we really need to base that with knowing where they are as a student. Every child will be coming back with different needs and needing to meet them at where they are at is key in knowing where they're at in an emotional and well-being base. If they're struggling, they don't need to be kind of chastised or punished for that component. We really need to recognize the need to elevate them and their mental well-being so they can thrive in a learning environment. Uh, it's, it's going to be key to understand each student and recognize each student's needs and come at it at an asset base, a strength-based approach. Um, recognizing, you know, everything that they've experienced in these four plus months and knowing that we have so many uncertainties head, ahead of us for this school year as well. We just don't know what it's going to look like. So we need to support them overall um, as well as academically. I really love the idea of building a system from a strength based approach for students and always assuming the best when you're looking at a student and always um, and a family, right? Like making sure that we are not making these assumptions because of the assaults on our imagination or because of the stereotypes and images that we've been fed over a period of time. Um, I think it'd be remiss to say that, uh, and I'm glad that you brought it up and a little embarrassed that I have not seen that I'm doing quite a bit of that in New York. Um, but the, the other pandemic, right? The, the, the second pandemic of 1619 and what that's doing to our country in terms of racial inequities and the exposure that COVID has helped bring to the light, um, as well as a number of other things that we've all uh, seen quite frequently um, on our phones and, and news channels. Um, I'm proud of you. Uh -huh. Yes, I just, just want to add you know, to what Kristen was saying. We've seen this before recently. In New Orleans, we went through Katrina and they had 43,000 kids all over the street. And instead of giving them the, the social emotional support they needed, they were shipped all across the country and put into normal situations. And think about those kids, that was 15 years ago. So the kids that are now graduating are the kids that went through Katrina. So these kids have gone through one trauma that was never really resolved. And now they're graduating in the middle of another traumatic experience. Again, that's why we're saying COVID have to, has to show us uh, a new way. 
We appreciate that, Dr. Mackey. Um, we're going to shift, that was actually a great way to help us shift gears uh, and unmute one of our panelists and ecosystem leaders, um, Dr. Irene Poro. Um, we'd love to have you answer your question. Uh, are you there with us? Yes, I'm here. Hello. Hello. All right, uh, well, I, I may in part read, first of all, thank you to all the speakers. Um, it feels me, it makes me feel really um, in good company uh, having this conversation because, and this is my question, you know, I've been part of many uh, conversations in the last several weeks about reopening schools, but most of this conversation uh, tend to focus on recreating what were the pre-COVID processes, including, for example, how do we test kids now if we have to work on uh, using online systems, just as an example. So, and I really believe that this is what makes people comfortable. The people who are currently in control of the education system feel comfortable thinking how we go back to those processes. And so my questions to all the panelists is how, give me, uh, I need your help. How can we, how can I promote conversations and really focus on what are the needs of our children and their families? So that when we start with the needs, then we can design a new system. Again, a quick example, um, recently here in Massachusetts, we say, okay, we, we had to bring our kids back in school because uh, we had to take care of the mental and physical health of our kids. If those are really our, um, the issues that we have and the goals that we have, and I agree with that, mental and physical and uh, health of our kids, I don't think that having our kids sit um, at, in their desk for six hours at three feet, at least a distance or more with a mask on their face is really the best way to address it. And I'm not criticizing that attempt to bring the kids back to school, but I think we can be more creative. So can you help me? Frank, I can go ahead and, and jump in. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I think you've heard it a few times already. I think we just have to name it and say school is obsolete. Let's acknowledge that the system has failed us. Let's start to re reclaim language and talk about leading with learning, talking about learning happens everywhere and put together from research, from other examples that exist, you know, mastery based systems, competency based systems where learning gets valued and gets credited and acknowledged. These are not new ideas. These have often been thought of as boutique ideas, but now the moment is finally caught up with these boutique ideas. So there's plenty of, of options out there. I, and, and it all comes from a space of listening and learning from communities. I think we've all heard this, you know, Calvin really talked through this as well. We can't come in and, and do for, we have to do alongside and do with from a perspective of listening to what communities really believe are the aspirational models of what learning needs to look like moving forward. And I, and I think we just all have to be honest and say, we have to name that it's a problem and we are going to do something in a design way. This is where STEM really comes into play, right? This is all about design. This is all about looking at constraints. This is all about prototyping. And this is all about recognizing that the system that's been in place has failed and we're, we're designing a new system. I could build upon that. I would say um, it is particularly communities who have been traditionally marginalized where this problem can be solved. And part of it is by actively engaging uh, with students and families to learn what they've learned in this shutdown period and help them to activate and advocate for the learning that they want for their children and to, to demand something better. Kids and families have a completely different awareness of what school did well and what school didn't do well because of being thrust at home. And so, for example, high school students who have long understood that it's ridiculous that you have to learn biology from 907 to 1004 Monday through Friday because somebody scheduled it that way, have a whole new appreciation of being able to work in the evening when they're at their best um, and doing their assignments in, on, in their online environment and are gonna push aggressively not to return to 907 to 1004 unless we force them to do it. And then also thinking about how do you use the ecosystem to solve the legitimate barriers that get in the way. So Cleveland has the single highest childhood poverty in the country 
We were ground zero for the housing crisis, fourth worst connected city in the country for internet. And, and so all of those could be barriers to say, just put it back to normal because people have to work. But what if we, at the same time, design these new systems that meet kids and families where they are and what they want with these different kinds of learning opportunities and solve for the problems that trap them back in the old system? So we won't, in Ohio, be able to bring all kids back to traditional school every day, five days a week, all day long. And that's going to leave my kids and families with legitimate child care issues. So we're actually working to empower our middle school and high school students to get certifications for babysitting so that they can use service hours to solve that community problem that allows us to define a different learning experience while simultaneously helping the kid and the family uh, to move out of the dilemma that keeps them trapped in it. So we've really got to use the opportunity to hear what our community wants and hear what prevents them from accessing this and then thinking how do we design solutions and that's where STEM uh, kind of planning, prototyping, and piloting can really be useful to us. And, and I'd like to add one example. Recently, the uh, New Orleans is the only city where every school is chartered. So we have this hodgepodge of schools, but we have an umbrella that's supposed to act like uh, a referee, a manager of these hodgepodge of schools. So they did a survey, and they came back from the survey and said that 87% of the respondents said one thing. And I asked one question, you know, how did you all uh, deliver the survey? They said online. <laughs> so, if, <laughs> you know, well, damn, of course. I mean, what about the people who are not online? You just said that you have these inequities and, 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 and little things like that. And, and, and it's tough because we are really, you know, I'm so glad y'all start talking about rebel leadership because one of my, you know, favorite people in the world was Benjamin Elijah Mays. He wrote a book called Born to Rebel. And it seemed like that's why I'm here. But when you talk about this thing, I, I just want to give you one little thing to think about in terms of how do we engage the community. If you look at a communication model, there's a sender, a message, a channel, and a receiver. Most of the times, we spend all the time focusing on a sender. But the sender has to be authentic and credible. Uh, the message has to be concise and relevant, but the channel has to be multivariate and clear but the receiver has to be targeted and understood. And we don't spend a lot of time trying to understand and target the receiver. Uh, it, that was a brilliant idea what Eric had about, you know, certifying the, the middle schoolers and high schoolers as uh, babysitters. We are proposed, we have these big events in, in public facilities anyway on Saturdays. We propose to the school systems, hey, how about we hire all these college kids that we do it anyway, Let's have STEM events in these public places. Instead of kids going to school, they'll come do three hours of, you know, of, of STEM, uh, STEM engagement and work towards a certification. So one day they may be going to school, but the next day they may be going down the street to the recreation facility that's right there in their community. And Kristen, I, I don't want to leave you out. And, and if you don't have anything um, to add to this, but as, as far as Dr. Poro's question, you know, in terms of schools and, and folks really being comfortable with trying to get us back to where we were, um, what does that look like differently, right? So we've heard that it, uh, it, it doesn't look the same and, and why are we trying to force that? So how do we, uh, you know, might be shifts in hour changes, it might be shifts in location. Um, what about the social emotional learning component? Yeah, I think the, the moment she said, obviously, that the mental well-being, the physical well-being, that is just key in terms of our, our approach as well. Um, I think I'm going to put my mom hat on for a minute. I have two teenage boys, and I think about the learning that they've had to manage themselves over the last uh, four months and, and with me trying to help and support from home as well that kind of understanding the whole family and needing to to work with the unique needs of, of the schools, but knowing the benefit of you ecosystems being there and being able to work as partners together. Um, our, our whole approach is really about training educators as well as school districts. That's our push right now around the social emotional needs of students as well as educators um, and supporting families as a whole, but also really integrating unique opportunities, really hopefully elevating the opportunity here and kind of thinking about the social emotional development and the STEM 
components together and how they can complement each other. But having those opportunities for learning in the field, going out, having hands-on, having inquiry-based, making students be able to move. The thought of my boys going from having to be stationary at home and now having to go into a classroom where they feel disconnected from their peers and their teachers, there's so much social emotional development needs to kind of build back that community and and hopefully not go back into the traditional setting. Um, as Mark said, we're at an opportunity to be really able to reclaim and hopefully change the model that we have. And I think given here in Massachusetts, we're at a point where we're looking at three different possible scenarios of like all in person, all online or some hybrid model. I can only hope that when it comes to all those options that the ability to move and bring in kind of of that active engagement, kind of the student voice, um, being part of that community is going to be key um, in really getting them not in sitting in a chair for six hours a day. I can't, I can't imagine hopefully not going back there. <laughs> right. So I want to be mindful of time. We have four minutes left. Um, and I want to throw out a very difficult question and ask um, perhaps that everybody takes about 30 seconds each to answer it. Um, maybe Mark, you can close us out and we'll, we'll end with you and your thoughts on it, if that's all right. Um, but this is a very challenging question and I'm asking you to answer it in 30 seconds, 45 seconds. Um, you know, I think all of you touched on the idea of transforming the system of we can't go back to the way things are and I think everybody on this call and ecosystem leaders know this right um, but again oftentimes we are the only ones in the room saying that and so being a true rebel leader when no one is listening to both the leaders in the room talking about let's change the system we just heard several examples about us not necessarily listening to the communities um, that have been marginalized and that they as eric so eloquently mentioned have the answers usually um, so knowing that people sort of have their earmuffs on how are you know what what can we do as we continue these conversations moving forward to really think about um helping people to listen especially when the truth is very hard for them to hear as we start reinventing this system um you know just very quick thoughts on strategies on opening up that listening uh so that we can can move forward and redesign together um so perhaps we just go in the order that we we, we came in, Eric, we start with you, Dr. Mackey, um, Kristen, and then Mark will close with you uh, and then follow up with everybody after. Thank you. Look, the bet I'm making in Cleveland is that we have a year where every leader, no matter where you sit, you're going to have to find a solution for your community that you lead because we can't go back to the way it was, even if we wanted to. And there are a lot who want to. So I got a year to prove that I can do something better for my community and with my community uh, so that a year from now, people have to take it away from us instead of us having to fight to get it. And that we use that in my case to influence the state of Ohio to change its policies. And ultimately we're gonna have to influence the, the nation, the federal government to change their policies. But if we're gonna get there, we have to prove that we can deliver something better that people will not give back uh, while other people are out there just doing the same old bad business that they've been doing for years. Thank you, Dr. Mackey. Uh, yes, in short, you have to build consensus. Uh, Seth Golden wrote a book called Tribe. You have to find your tribe. You have to find like-minded people in your community and go do something that otherwise prove uh, that, that, that the model that they're using is wrong. That, that is what we have been doing I do my politics by addition, so we just continue to add people. And sooner or later, they look over there and they ask, why are we not doing that? So now the proof is in a pudding, and we are poking the bear with every chance we, we, we get to say, why do you keep going back? You know, I'll never forget when I was getting married and I was being, I was being uh, counseled. I probably need counseling now. I know, but the minister said, <laughs> he said, you know, you know, don't get a new address and keep showing up to your old house. So we have to create a new address and keep pointing out th that old house that we can cannot go back to. Thank you, and I appreciate that. I think the SLE COP is, is truly our tribe, right? Like how do we keep That's coming it. back to us as a tribe? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, Kristen. Yeah, I would add, um, I think just thinking about how we can listen and promote listening. I think at PEAR, we consider ourselves a translational center, meaning we really try to listen to the field 
of practitioners and take what they're teaching us to like improve our tools and our trainings and our resources that we can do. Our approach is really about working on all systems. Obviously, we are thrilled to be working with the ecosystems and being able to support the work you guys are doing, but hearing from practitioners and, and supporting what you guys are doing, but also listening to students, listening to educators, listening to families. Um, we really are all about at PAIR about using living data and collecting feedback and collecting surveys, both online as well as PDFs. At this point, I, I wanna promote, we really wanna work with data that we're learning from, listen to the trainings and listen to practitioners to hopefully get all those ears open and to be able to address the needs generally. We are kind of at one point of information gathering, but we want to hear from each kind of the, the field environments to be able to, to best do our services to, to support everybody. I'll close with a, a few thoughts. Um, perhaps not much new, you, you've all said it well, but you know, we all recognize, at least I, I think we do, that not all education systems are as fortunate to have someone like Eric Gordon as a rebel leader leading those systems. But that doesn't mean we still don't have a responsibility as engaged citizens to do something. We can't just continue to look at the leader that's in place and say, well, change won't happen. The, the entire purpose of a STEM ecosystems model of a community of practice is to ensure that education is not just the responsibility of those that are in the K-12 or post-secondary space. It's to say that the entire community has a responsibility, all partners have a responsibility, but that requires action. And so <clears throat> we know that everyone on this Zoom right now is a leader. Uh, so what's the responsibility as a leader to collaborate and to engage in K-12 in ways that perhaps you haven't or you were looking for the entry point? Well, the entry point is now. The urgency of, of the collaboration for the redesign is now. Uh, and so I think that's, that's sort of where this begins. It begins from a des design perspective, fundamentally based on everything that's foundational to STEM learning ecosystems and a community of practice and, and the work that we, we do at TIES, which is unite and convene partners. We all are not experts for everything, but we can convene experts and thought leaders when engaged with the community to solve these challenges and problems together. And so I think with that, I'll, um, I'll close by offering a sincere thank you to all of my colleagues who joined the panel for your thought leadership, for your continued push to do more and to, uh, and to be rebel leaders. Uh, for all of you who've joined, we know you're doing this work right now. And perhaps this is just that extra push and challenge for you to, to think about what else you can do. And um, we're here as, uh, we're here for support. The community of practice exists to provide the kind of support and resources for these challenging times. And so we encourage you to reach out, activate us as best you can, and we'll follow up specifically with questions to see what, uh, what questions you have, what needs you have, and how we can be supportive as well. Great, Enjoy. well, thank you. Yeah, thank you everyone. Thank you for the time. Um, and we will follow up and continue the conversation. Thank you again to all of our panelists. Have a great rest of your afternoon.